Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Welcome to Digital Art at Google's lecture series. This is our second show. Uh, we write this to you from the distant future, uh, co-sponsored co by the Chelsea Art Museum. Uh, my name is Scott Draves, and I'll be the MC for tonight. And I'm standing in for Josh Middleman, who's really the, the Google engineer who uh, initiated uh, this project. And um, unfortunately, he, he can't be here tonight, and he sends his, his regrets. But uh, Google's mission is to uh, organize the world's information and make it accessible. And art is one way of uh, accessing or understanding information. And so we thought since our office here is in New York and in Chelsea, uh, and our, our and because of our, uh, our, we thought that it would be great to get some, to reach out to the art world and uh, work together. And so that's how, and so Josh contacted uh, Nina Colosi who uh, curated these shows and brought us uh, the wonderful artists who we're going to uh, hear here tonight. So first, we have James Tunick, and uh, later, uh, Jack Twillin will be speaking. So James is an artist focused on the intersection of creativity and technology in public spaces, an entrepreneur and software developer. He lives and works in New York City where he founded Studio IMC. His work has been featured at Arts Electronica, the USF Contemporary Art Museum, uh, Rolling Stone Magazine, the Museum of Modern Art, the New York Times, and uh, many venues and, and media outlets. He has two patents pending on software that allows large audience participation with games, ads, and digital art on billboards and video screens in Times Square, Major League Baseball stadiums, and the like. Tunic co-founded Mapsity, a social platform that uses Google Earth and Web5 Design, a web development firm. He's been a very busy guy. Uh, Tunic received his BA from Yale University and his master's from the NYU Tisch Interactive Telecommunications Program, ITP. So take it away, James. Thank you very much. introduction. Um, so first I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of personal background um, and then talk a little bit more about um, professional background. Um, I'm going to skip through the, the bio that Scott uh, mostly just read and kind of try and boil that down into a few key points. Um, who am I? I am uh, again an artist, a software developer, and an entrepreneur. Um, my focuses are really at the intersection of art, technology, and gaming in public spaces. Um, my work appears on the web, uh, mobile devices, and also in public spaces on big screens. And the reasons I do these things and, and the things that uh, really drive me are my passion and, and wanting to really encourage creativity in public spaces, empowering people to express themselves in public spaces, and enhancing future cities, using technology and art as a way to make our cities more livable. I um, feel very strongly, and, and I'm really very passionate about this, this idea that actually has been around for, for some time, since uh, the 60s, and uh, Rauschenberg's work, and uh, EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology at the Armory here in New York. And really feel strongly that the intersection of technology and art, especially in public spaces, has the power to inspire a sense of magic. It uh, allows us to strengthen communication in communities. Um, it allows uh, people to become artists in public spaces. It puts um, you know, the, the power into the hands of people in city streets to express themselves on the sides of buildings and elsewhere. Um, has the power to stimulate community collaboration, invite free speech and public discourse. Uh, of course, these are all uh, idealistic ways of, of looking at these things. Uh, I think that uh, technology in public spaces uh, is a double-edged sword and can also be used for, for bad things. But, um, you know, we're starting to see new forms of storytelling, new forms of gaming, 
um, technology and art that provides easier access to information and entertainment in public spaces. And increasingly, this is becoming known as the outer net. Um, you know, in, in uh, the industry, it's called digital out of home and usually refers to advertising, but uh, my focus is, is both in the arts, entertainment, um, as well as in advertising. Um, so if you can imagine a, a city of the future where the city becomes even more of a cultural hub than it already is, um, where buildings become canvases and cell phones become paintbrushes, where every person has the power to express themselves on the side of a building or play a, a large audience game. Um, I'm going to walk through uh, some of my early artworks. I'm going to try and actually go through the presentation rather quickly so that I can show videos and, uh, and live demos of some of these artworks. Um, one of the first uh, works that I consider important is a 9-11 memorial sculpture called Why uh, that I built uh, at Yale University. It was um, essentially two planks of wood. Um, bunch of magic markers and a plaque that asked people to express themselves and, and answer the question, uh, why, uh, in, in regards to 9-11. And within days, it was absolutely covered in writing and diagrams and people uh, discussing the topic with each other, comments connected with lines and um, drawings and pictures and, I mean, everything under the sun in terms of opinions and, and um, you know, the ways that people are expressing themselves about these, these sad events. Um, from there, um, at ITP, the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU, uh, I began to think more about free speech in public spaces and, and how to leverage technology um, as a way to allow people to, to express themselves more easily. Um, created a, a work called the Free Speech Bulletin, which was a fairly basic installation it allowed people to send text messages to a mobile projection. So there was a boat battery, there was a screen on wheels, we would project on buildings or on the screen on wheels, and allow people to answer questions about uh, politics, the local community, and um, you know, essentially allow people to express themselves and, and their opinions. Um, from there, I created a, a work with uh, another artist named Miro Kira, who is a classmate at ITP. Uh, this is a work called Infinite City, um, where using gesture, people can fly through uh, a 3D cityscape and also compose music in real time. So it's a multi-user, immersive environment uh, that allowed people to express themselves through music and kind of fly through this futuristic uh, cityscape. Uh, you'll see there are some common themes in terms of this idea of uh, the future city, and uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit more specifically about City of the Future, which is the, the work uh, outside that I've got installed with uh, my wife, Carrie Elston Tunick, and uh, another colleague, Josh Schiller. Um, next early work is, is a, a piece of technology called the Media Bandit. And you'll see that a lot of my work kind of bridges commercial and art world. Um, I consider on the art side this a, a type of kind of media pop art. Um, at the same time, many of the artworks that, that I've created and, uh, with with colleagues and, and others at Studio IMC have been used commercially by clients like Heineken and others. Um, so this was essentially a portable DJ station that people could take out to events. Um, started actually my career in, in doing live video mixing and DJ work in nightclubs and restaurants uh, as, a, as a teenager. And so I'm very interested in this idea of kind of putting the audience into the visuals at these events and um, you know, essentially created a, a piece of software that allowed live video mixing, live video to be mixed in with uh, some of the logos. Um, this is another early work called Cell Sketch, and I'll, I'll demo this a little bit later as well. Um, this is a work that allows people to sketch with the light from their cell phone. So standing in front of a screen, you can draw a smiley face, you can spell your name, and essentially the, the phone becomes a paintbrush. Uh, it also uh, generates sound when you move your phone, and so there's this uh, kind of connection between you and, and the screen, both visually and uh, in terms of music. Um, another early work uh, that's related to Infinite City, this is a work called Collaborative Immersive Network Environment, or SIGN. Um, this was uh, another immersive environment that um, 
Uh, it was kind of a vision of, of future cities. It allowed people to send pictures from city streets and then those pictures would show up in a 3D city and it was a multi-user environment. Uh, multiple people could control it and, and fly through the space. I'll show a video of this as well later on. And then the pictures could actually be posted as billboards on any of the virtual buildings. So the idea was kind of this mixture of virtual and real. And also, um, this was part of my research at, at ITP and kind of getting towards this idea of the multi-user computer interface, the environment. Um, the mouse and keyboard is, is rather restrictive when it comes to navigating the web, making music, and so uh, this was really an attempt at kind of experimenting with a multi-user interface, putting the computer into the space, tracking uh, hand movement and body movement, and allowing people to fly through this 3D city. Um, I just mentioned this, this work uh, briefly. This is a white paper um, and, and actually a paper that was selected as a, a finalist in the design competition at the State of Play Social Evolutions Conference. And really it was kind of the first time that um, I began to think about this idea of blending cell phones, displays, and social software in, in public spaces. This idea has evolved some since, but um, really convinced that we're going to see the internet evolve into the internet. That there will be in public spaces, uh, emerging of mobile devices, uh, big screens, media facades and architecture, as well as the web. Social software, as, as we know it today, is, uh, is still fairly basic. And I think that um, you know, in the future, we will see uh, in public spaces how these can add up to become more than the sum of their parts. Um, Another early work uh, that I built uh, with my wife and, and another colleague, Aaron Schiller, um, this is called Park of the Future. Um, this was featured in the LA Times and really is kind of the first inkling of, of the next work I'll talk about, City of the Future. The work is, is really a, a concept that ties into many of the things I've already mentioned. Um, media facades, reskinnable buildings, um, promoting free speech through text messaging, picture messaging, and really trying to encourage public discourse um, in neighborhoods and city parks. Uh, this is a more recent work. This is a stereoscopic 3D environment called Parallel Cityscapes uh, that was at the uh, USF Contemporary Art Museum. Uh, you would put on stereo glasses, which you now see in, in a lot of movie theaters, similar types of 3D, where it pops out of the screen. And this was actually uh, the first time um, that I showed uh, what's called the IMC space, which I'll talk uh, about a little bit later on, essentially a 3D visualization of YouTube videos and other data feeds where the user can fly through an immersive space and kind of see the universe of data uh, related to certain YouTube users or um, other large data sets. Another recent work um, called Circuit. This is a video artwork uh, that was shown by Nina and, and Streaming Museum on billboards around the world. Um, another information visualization 3D space that takes Twitter feeds and puts them into a 3D environment that you can fly through. And this is the work that's on display at Ars Electronica right now and, and here in the lobby at, uh, at Google. Um, and actually, this will probably be better explained by the video later on, so I'm going to continue to, to kind of uh, push through the presentation here and go into more detail in a bit. So those are kind of my personal artworks. Um, I also, as, as Scott mentioned, founded a, a company out of college called Studio IMC. Um, we are essentially a collective of programmers and artists. Uh, we do work both commercially and in the arts. Um, all of our programmers are also artists, and we represent them in that we put them into art shows at museums and galleries um, and curate these shows uh, at museums and galleries. So this is uh, one of the first shows that we did um, called Convergence, uh, which was about uh, the mixture of virtual and real. Um, another Studio IMC art show, a three-month show at the Museum of TV and Radio, which is now called uh, the Paley Center for Media, uh, which was trying to imagine future forms of entertainment. Uh, it's called uh, 
be on TV and, and was uh, again focused on new media artists from Studio IMC. Um, second IMC exposition. This is a trade show and art show that Studio IMC puts on about every two years. It started out as an annual show but uh, became a, a larger production than, than expected. And this is uh, the second expo uh, which involved holographic light sculptures, uh, interactive installations, um, and a variety of other types of works. This is the more recent IMC exposition. Uh, I think the, the catalogs may have been passed around and will give you kind of, a, I think, a, a good idea of how we bridge uh, the art world and, and uh, the commercial world, uh, big screens and public spaces. We were lucky enough to have Dactronics as a partner, a streaming museum as a partner. Uh, Dactronics is the, the largest maker of billboards in the world and uh, they're in baseball stadiums and in addition we also uh, showed many of the works by Studio IMC artists, emerging artists from ITP um, and all of them with a focus on uh, you know, promoting collaboration, public spaces, allowing people to participate in the artworks uh, either through phone, through gesture, through voice control. So. This leads into some of my uh, more commercial work, but I think that the two are really interjoined. Um, Studio IMC is, is a new media lab here in New York City. Um, we build software for the outer net, producing games and, and art and interactive ads for big screens and public spaces. Um, as I mentioned before, we also represent an international team. Oops, sorry about that. Thank you. We also represent uh, an international team of artists and programmers, uh, many of them from ITP, some of them colleagues from Yale, others met over the years in, in Europe and in Asia, and we show their work again in, in museums and at the Studio IMC Lab and Gallery here in New York. Um, our approach is to develop creative software tools that inspire a sense of magic and invite collaboration in public spaces through interactivity, engagement, and measurement. A uh, short list of, of some of our clients. Um, we produce three technologies for big screens that again can push digital art, they can push ads, uh, new types of entertainment and gaming to big screens and to phones. Um, Two of the software platforms have patents pending. Um, the software powers the world's first network of interactive movie screens. So before the movies start, people can pull out their phones or wave at the screen to play a game uh, or interact in some way. Um, in stadiums, at concerts, uh, video walls and building lobbies. And the platform is really, I think all of this kind of ties back to our early work in, in video art and DJing and, and pushing digital art into public spaces. This is a platform that works on screens of any size. Um, and it allows people to interact through one of three ways. And um, first way is through cell phone interaction. So it's either through texting or sending pictures or actually calling into a number and then the phone becomes uh, a joystick to the screen. You can have hundreds or even thousands of people playing at once. Um, gesture interaction, so we, um, part of my background at, at Yale and ITP was in computer vision and, and uh, face tracking. Um, and so we allow audience members to essentially play the game or, or interact with the artwork using hand gestures, using face movement, body movement. Uh, and then voice interaction is the third type of interactivity. These can be blended. Um, City of the Future out in the lobby actually uses both uh, cell phone interaction and gesture interaction. Um, the platform works with multiple modules, multiple pieces of interactive content essentially. Um, we have about a hundred of these modules, some of them are digital artworks, some of them are advertisements, some of them are games. And um, this is uh, the software being used in, in Times Square currently by Sony and, and News Corp at one Times Square where people can send votes and it shows up on the screen in, in real time. Um, Houston Astros are using the software to allow fans to send pictures of their kids up to the screen, um, send chat messages, and um, also to vote uh, for their favorite players. Uh, Dallas Mavericks have been using it for similar purposes. Um, these are two large audience games in movie theaters that we built recently. Uh, one is for Sprint. The one in the upper left is uh, for Benihana restaurants. 
the Benihana game, the audience could put their hands up and essentially um, help a chef catch shrimp in his hat. So moving left and right, the hat would move left and right with the audience, and um, basically a large audience game. People are jumping out of their seats and screaming and yelling, trying to take control of the chef's hat. Um, game on the right, uh, you would call into a phone number. Uh, hundreds of people can play at once. You hop out of a limo, you dodge paparazzi, and you make your way to the movie premiere. Um, more basic uh, types of interactivity in movie theaters with voting, um, some big audience games for film studios. I'm going to zip through some of the rest of this so we have time for some of the videos and, and live demos. Um, this is a technology I mentioned earlier where the phone actually becomes a, a game controller. Uh, this is for uh, Diageo. Um, Heineken augmented reality. This is uh, something called Magic Mirror. It was on display at the Time Warner Center. Um, IMC TV has been used for digital art uh, at the IAC building. Um, they claim to have the largest HD video wall in the world. I think it's over 120 feet long. And we created three custom modules for those screens. Uh, video walls for the Nets in Times Square, immersive environments for national amusements where there was digital art and uh, movie trailers on all the screens. Um, we've also done some R&D with artificially intelligent characters and, and holograms that will respond to speech and movement. Um, let's get through some of this. This is our mobile platform. We've also developed a, a technology that allows both in, in the arts and commercially, um, signage owners and building owners to track how many people have looked at this play. Doesn't know who you are, doesn't record video. Think of this as click tracking for public spaces. Um, this is uh, the final piece of technology I'm, I'm going to talk about before heading into the videos. Um, this is a piece of technology called IMC Space, which is essentially a visualization of large data sets. So whether it plugs into YouTube or Flickr, uh, what it does is that it provides a bird's eye view of large data sets. So the taller the buildings, the more views the YouTube video has gotten. Clusters are users, and the clusters next to them are their friends. So, you know, if you're looking for a very specific video, of course, you can use uh, standard Google search and it sends you directly to the video. If you want to see the universe of videos around a user and get an idea of kind of the bird's eye view of that data set, um, this is uh, essentially a way of, of doing so. So this is a fly through 3D space um, that has been in artworks and, and um, we have not used it commercially in any way, but um, our hope is that this is potentially a way of visualizing large data sets on the web in the future. So, um, you know, I really feel very strongly that with the video game generation growing up and with people um, living in a 3D environment, that the web will soon become an immersive 3D space that you can fly through. There will still be a use for the flat page, for reading, for searching for a single thing. But the, the magic, the, the immersive experience of flying through a large data set, I think, is, is uh, bound to take over. Of course, there have, since the 70s and 80s, been people talking about virtual reality and the hopes for 3D, and it's kind of flopped and, and flopped time and time again. But uh, I think that inevitably the fact that we think in 3D, that our memories, uh, our memory is actually much stronger in, in terms of a spatial memory. You think about how many items can you remember in your home folder on your computer? Maybe five, maybe ten. How many items can you remember in your home? The soap dish, the clock the lamp on the bedside table, your spatial memory is much stronger than trying to remember a list or, or a bunch of names. So I think that that's fairly inevitable at, at some point. Um, my hope is that computer of the future will not be this tiny thing that one person sits in front of, but it becomes an environment. Um, and of course, the city of the future is a place where people can play games, paint on the side of buildings, and, uh, and the like. So I'm going to quickly show a video of the city of the future. 
um, which is the artwork uh, out here in, in the lobby. I'm going to skip, I think, some of the others. City of the Future. Concept. Free speech and the environment. Imagine a new type of ubiquitous communication medium that builds community and encourages creativity by making culture visible in public spaces. Envision a city that is constantly interacting with and aware of its natural environment. Buildings and networked objects built with green materials display key info about their surroundings, such as local pollution levels, energy consumption, or recycling habits. One day we will see each other and see our environment in brand new ways. It is our hope to create a model showing that cities can one day become smart spaces and large-scale augmented environments with embedded technologies that promote free speech, green thinking, and creative innovation. Cities will be more transparent and democratic, buildings and parks filling with people's ideas and artworks. Our method is to offer an open source model or open blueprint for future urban architecture and public spaces that combine green architecture, smart spaces, ambient displays, immersive environments, mobile devices, and networked objects. Our goal is to encourage free speech, community innovation, and sustainability for future generations. Phase one of the project consists of responsive architecture and outdoor immersive environments. Such environments and architecture act actually as, as types of skins. Think of it as a replaceable desktop. Each building would have its own look and feel that could change day to day. At one moment, uh, an ocean landscape. Uh, at another moment, a, a rainforest. Projections on the sides of the buildings means that the architecture becomes totally malleable. Um, in a way can be totally changeable, changes the sense of space. The second phase of the project is about community collaboration, uh, where we would use ambient architectural displays for location-specific environmental data. For example, um, the environmental light sculpture actually shows how bad global warming is gotten. So this can be a, a monument in the middle of a city, a large sculpture in a city park, and uh, is powered by solar panels. In addition, there are also location-specific environmental data displays on buildings that show local energy consumption levels and recycling. Um, another type of light sculpture using wireless technologies might be a pollution meter, showing people how bad pollution is in a certain part of a city. Uh, the third part of the project is creative culture and um, using free speech spaces and community bulletin boards, uh, people would be encouraged to create and, and participate in local politics, uh, play big games, see tourist maps, participate in culture and entertainment, um, send comments to bulletins in, in parks, trading videos, sending text messages about local issues. And the fact is, this can be something outdoors, this can be something indoors, uh, like the media immersion room seen here, where people essentially are, are able to um, use the space as, as a place for collaboration, as a place for free expression. Um, as a whole, using smart architecture and wireless technologies, it's our hope to offer this open source model um, that will actually build stronger communities. The city will come alive at one moment a rainforest, the next moment teeming with user-generated videos and comments from the cell phone on issues like the status of the local school system. The city will be an open candidate for expression, responding to our every need and allowing urban dwellers to communicate on a higher level. Such an urban society would not only be more beautiful, but would also promote creativity, justice, accountability, and a closer, more transparent community. I'm going to have to excuse uh, the poor sound and, and rough graphics. This video is actually about... Um, Three, four years old at this point. Um, and I think that that's probably about all the time I, I have here. I wanted to show one last item if I have 10 seconds. Sure. Um, this is actually the artwork that's on display out, out front. And actually, I'll turn the video tracking on. 
This is pulling uh, YouTube videos live from the web. And uh, again, the taller the video, the more views it's gotten. Um, each cluster is a user. So this is Lonely Girl 15 and her friends. And again, the idea is that you can kind of get an idea of the universe of, of videos around this user and her friends. I'm able to navigate the space using the light from my phone, uh, as is true in the installation outside. And um, anyway, this is uh, an example of, of the types of, of work that, that I'm doing. And uh, it's being done by other artists at Studio IMC. Um, with that said, uh, if you'd like to see the presentation, other demos, uh, a lot of this will be available at studioimc.com forward slash Google. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions if, uh, if anybody has something they want to ask James. So that's yeah. for the recording. So the, the question was, have I thought about readability and accessibility in terms of putting large data sets in, in public spaces, correct? So, you know, text uh, in a 3D space is a particular challenge. People are used to looking for labels and tags uh, when it comes to especially user-generated content. Um, I think, however, that, you know, the ability, first of all, to zoom in and see some of this text and also to be able to, from the bird's eye view, get visual cues about the information without the use of text, allows the information potentially to be more accessible. So from pulling back and, and kind of once you understand, of course, there's a key for, for many of these visualizations that'll tell you, you know, X axis is the user, uh, the Y axis is the number of views that the video has gotten, the z-axis is, you know, another uh, parameter um, that once people understand that key, the information can become more accessible. Also, if there are visual cues as to what things mean, it can be more intuitive. I think uh, Brad W. Paley spoke a little bit about that in, in his talk in terms of using uh, iconic imagery and, and uh, visual cues that allow you to kind of immediately understand uh, what the information uh, visualization means. We have time for one more question. Yes, you made a couple of references to hologram. Mm -hmm. Is that literally true? I mean, do you, are you at literally producing holograms? There are a couple different types of uh, holographic display technologies that we've been working with. Most of our focus is on the software side. Um, but we work with artists that build LED structures, sculptures that will have volumetric images floating inside of them. So you can't pass your hand through it, but it is volumetric uh, holographic image. Uh, we've also worked with a, a variety of different semi-transparent materials that you can project through from multiple angles and uh, create a holographic effect as well. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll have uh Jack Tulin. So Jack is an interdisciplinary artist whose work spans photography, performance art, and new media. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally at venues such as the Whitney Museum of American Art, the San Jose Museum of Art, the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes Buenos, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, at Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria. He is visiting assistant professor at Pratt Institute and adjunct professor at Polytechnic Institute at NYU. Are you ready to go? Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Nina to our, for putting this together. And thanks to Google, Scott, and Andrew uh, for inviting me to talk. So um, I'm going to 
focus on a project uh, that is a complex project and multidimensional. Uh, but I do want to give you a little bit of background about myself and where the project comes from. Um, my name is Jack, and uh, for 10 years I was a collaborator in a group called C5, and we were based in Silicon Valley. Uh, we got together in 97 and collaborated till 2007 working on a range of projects, but they were all about technology, culture, art, and theory. Um, and as you can see in my little blurb up there, our motto was theory as product. So the projects that we would work on were largely driven by uh, reading and thinking we were doing regarding uh, technology and its effect uh, on culture. This list of people are my collaborators there uh, for this project that I'm going to focus on. It's called the Landscape Initiative. Um, but to give you uh, just a little bit of background on the group and where we were coming from, as I said, we got together in 97. And uh, being in Silicon Valley, we were kind of caught up in the whole dot-com rush and um, uh, producing work that was really screen-based early on, doing data visualization work. Uh, like the image that you see at the top there is actually a, a page of linkable uh, colors that take you to uh, uh, posted websites in a database that we accumulated uh, with a, a crawler that would go out and ping potential uh, URLs and record URLs that were hosted. Uh, it was an alternate way of surfing the web, in a sense, and because of the way the the uh, octets for the IP addresses are arranged on the screen. It, in a sense, gave you a portrait of web space. Um, and I can tell more about that piece or anything I'm talking about. I'm just kind of skimming through this just to give you the background. So this is a, a screen-based piece. It's you know, so-called net art. Uh, the piece over on the right with the green, um, that was a piece of software that we wrote that you could download to your computer and it would scan your hard drive and kind of examine the way you work with information. How many folders you create, how many folders within folders you make, and what the size of the documents are within those folders. Um, it wouldn't tell you anything more specific in the, than that, but that information alone can tell a lot about um, the way a person works with information and what kinds of information they're working with. You know, the size of the document could relate to text file or image kind of file. The image on the bottom there, um, is you don't see that you don't see. And it stands out uh, because it's an actual full-on theater piece that was about artificial intelligence. We wrote a play and performed a play that was about uh, Alan Turing and John Searle's debate about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, so we, we really ran a wide gamut of work from screen-based work to performance-based work. And uh, the group of people that was listed prior, and that group, expanded and contracted with other members and whatnot. Um, you know, we came from a range of backgrounds and a range of interests, and uh, from programming to performance art and, and whatnot. So we were all applying our skills to do this, uh, our projects over time. So anyway, the piece I'm going to focus on is the, the C5 Landscape Initiative, which uh, was a piece that we started uh, thinking about in 2002 and it was really based on the notion of doing expeditions and using GPS technology to generate data and apply that data for different purposes. So the, the four projects that came out of that are the analogous landscape, the other path, perfect view, and the C5 GPS media player. They look like this. Uh, they don't look like that. <laughs> So, but if you are interested in reading, these are some people good, uh, they're worthwhile checking out. Denis Cosgrove uh, writes about our perception of landscape and how that's affected by culture. And Kevin Lynch is a famous uh, person uh, talking about cognitive mapping in the, the 50s. That's a famous book, uh, Touchstone for anybody thinking about urban mapping and whatnot, uh, the image of the city. Mitchell is a current writer uh, talking about network technologies and our experience of space. And Yi Fu Tuan has been writing for decades now about the, the nature of uh, space and how does it become place. So they're kind of more philosophical texts, uh, kind of interesting reading there. Uh, so, but here are what the projects look like, right? Here's the analogous landscape, okay? 
And uh, with the analogous <coughs> landscape, uh, as I say here, predictive modeling based upon analogous expeditions. Our idea was that if we hiked uh, some number of uh, mountains in the ring of fire around the Pacific Rim, which are all volcanic mountains, and by that fact, they have somewhat similar uh, topological features. If we hike those mountains and record our hikes and take that data set from, say, five mountains, can we predict how to hike the sixth mountain? Uh, and that was our starting notion. And we first hiked uh, Mount Shasta, which is in Northern California, about five hours north of uh, San Francisco. So we spent a weekend hiking through the snow, uh, using crampons and the whole bit, because it's much safer, believe it or not, to hike in the snow than it is in dry rocks. And, um, and along the way, uh, we were uh, taking surveys. We each had a Palm Pilot, the fancy technology of the day. And on the Palm Pilot, it had a survey asking us what was our impression of the landscape? How did we feel about, physically feel about the hike so far? Had we seen anything sublime yet? These kinds of questions. And we would take the survey every half hour and kind of, uh, that would kind of be a way of estimating our progress or how we felt through the hike. And you know, potentially, after you get over 10,000 feet, you become a different person. So the survey, <laughs> survey would transform a little bit. But, uh, and then psychogeography does tap back into Guy Debord, if anybody's read Guy Debord. And he was kind of more thinking about urban situations, but we're applying it to a more natural situation. And just to bump back, this is when we achieved, we, uh, we uh, conquered the summit. So that's us sitting up there. And the, the picture down there on the right is a, is a digital reproduction of Shasta uh, using USGS data fed into a CNC machine and making a little foam reproduction of the mountain. Um, so in the uh, exhibition, uh, the pieces look like this. Uh, we have uh, Shasta is on the right and Fuji is on the left. So we got two mountains conquered. <laughs> Our goal was to go and go and go. But you know, the funding sources were like, sure, right. <laughs> great idea. But it's a great idea. And, and the, the, uh, the piece uh, functions well in a gallery to get the concept across. And that's mostly what we're concerned with. So uh, what we've got are three foot by three foot aluminum reproductions of the two mountains that we did hike, Sh uh, Shasta and Fuji. And then behind that are uh, CGI models of the two mountains rendered again from USGS data and the Japanese equivalent of that. And uh, that is a video in the background that has the mountains slowly rotating and with a little red line showing how, the, how we hiked the mountains. And it kind of dissolves between the two. Therefore, you get to compare the similarity or dissimilarity of the two hikes. So, you know, the goal was to have five of these, or six, or 10. You know? And it really would have been beautiful to have a nice array of mountains. Uh, but because of who we were, which was very kind of ADD, we had to get the next project done, and we didn't have a lot of money. It was very expensive to do what we did. We got that done. and. Uh, we're pretty happy with that. So an, another project within the landscape initiative um, was the other path. And in the other path, uh, we're interested in taking a data set and using that data set to see if we could find similar topographies in the world that would trigger similar psychological experiences. In other words, a kind of a deja vu experience. So one of our members went to China and traveled the length of the Great Wall and used a GPS device as they did so and came back with that data set. It was very heavy. <laughs> so they got this big data set and uh, we used that to look for a similar location topographically, topologically speaking, in California uh, with the notion that potentially we could find a similar topography and therefore kind of experience the Great Wall all over again. And uh, just in terms of um, computational uh, interest, you know, it presents a large data mining problem of looking at this big uh, set of data and trying to find similar uh, qualities in this other set. And in fact, one of our 
group members as a professor at UC San Diego. So we had access to some powerful computing, but it was still a very, um, I don't know, insurmountable problem. So we had to really, really reduce down what we were looking for to looking at square kilometers and measuring the low point and the high point and seeing what the average was between them. And if we found uh, two kilometers, one being California, one in China, that were similar, then we move on to the next kilometer. And if those are similar, we move on to the next kilometer and so forth. So it was a very kind of uh, crude search in the end, but ultimately we did find um, a section of uh, California uh, topography in Northern California, ironically enough, about 14 miles south of Mount Shasta where we started our first expedition. And um, this topography was very much like the section of uh, land in China. It's uh, we went there and hiked it, and there's a fun story behind that whole thing, but uh, I'll skip that for a moment. Here's the installation. Uh, it's two pieces of uh, digitally etched glass that are about an inch thick and four feet by four feet. Uh, the one on the right over here is China, and the one on the left is obviously California. So when you're in a gallery, you see these two projections, you see the etched glass, and within the projections, you're seeing video documentation from the expedition in China, and then uh, video docu documentation from the expedition in California, as well as kind of an animated recreation of the search. So as you look at the piece, you get a sense of uh, the process of making the piece, both in terms of physical expeditions, but also in terms of the, the data mining that was going on. So one of our goals with this work was that since we had been doing so much screen-based work in the late 90s and prior to this, and one of the things that we noticed was there was a lack of engagement by the public. If you, the work we were showing is typically in galleries and museums, and people are much, seem to be much more engaged by more physical, sculptural kinds of work, more conventional in an art world sense. Uh, so we were trying to merge our interests in data and technology with a more visceral experience that you might expect to get from a museum. So we, that's one of the reasons why we kind of transitioned into this very kind of tactile, visceral, uh, sculptural work that's glass and aluminum and whatnot. And uh, there was a lot of craftsmanship and they were, they were really beautiful pieces. They are. The third piece is called Perfect View and that's the one that um, I was kind of like the project manager for and we would kind of do that. We'd choose various people to head up these projects. This is the one I was in charge of. And um, what it ended up being was a 13,000 mile trek around the country guided by sublime sites, supposedly sublime sites, uh, whose locations were given to me by geocachers. And geocaching is a hobby where people create a treasure, they hide the treasure somewhere. There, there are caches around here in the city, but most of them are out in rural areas. So they hide these treasures and they record the latitude and longitude coordinates for them and put them up on a website. And then other geocachers, and there's thousands of them in the country, go and look for the caches for fun, for exercise, and it's a family thing, it's all kinds of reasons to go. But this was uh, a large group of people that I could approach and say, well, give me latitude and longitude coordinates for places that you think are sublime. And that generated a whole conversation online with this group of people about what is sublimity and how is it looked at in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries versus today. So there was kind of an interesting dialogue that happened out of that. But ultimately, I was given um, uh, 60 locations from which I chose about 25. So the picture that you're seeing on the left here is one of the caches. Uh, not a fabulous cache, just a plastic box with some stuff in it. But the real idea of, of geocaching is to get to unusual locations that you wouldn't necessarily go to. So this happens to be in um, the northeast edge of the lower peninsula of Michigan, where there is a river with a big oxbow turn. And you have to hike through the woods to get there. And when you get there, you're like above this really cool turn in the river that you wouldn't know about, really, unless you were a geocacher or you live locally. So. Uh, these are some of the sites that I was given uh, everywhere from, you see, Mississippi and Texas and oddly enough, uh, very few in the southwest, you know, like 
Uh, no one gave me the Grand Canyon, but I would have skipped it anyway. Um, the obvious ones, I. What's that? Get some time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, these are what the pieces look like for a perfect view. They're triptychs. There are three panels. Uh, the large one is a photographic documentation of the location. They're about you know six, seven feet large, shot digitally and then stitched together. So you kind of have a panoramic effect. But they're combined also with uh, satellite, aerial satellite imagery of that location with a dot that tells you where I was for the experience of sublimity when I made the photograph. And then the lower left image is a CGI uh, recreation of the topography using USGS data fed into a 3D modeler, right? So you're looking at the landscape in these three different modes. So hopefully, um, it encourages people to reflect on the new advents of, of imaging and experiencing these topographies and uh, what does it, how does it affect our experience of nature, of these topographies? Can we evaluate the topography and come up with some kind of uh, ideas about what sublime is or not? You know, um, This is in northern uh, New York, looking up at the Adirondacks. It happens to be what's called a virtual cache. Uh, there's no box there. You're intended to go there and just experience the site. This is in Kentucky. It's a natural arch. Uh, it's a pretty cool piece because uh, it does have this, all this natural beauty. But down in the bottom left corner, it has Michael loves Deborah, so, <laughs> and that was that was heartwarming. Uh, this is up in Maine, and this is a video that I'll skip because uh, it runs a little bit long. But it's a really nice interview. It's up on YouTube. My channel is Mad Chalet. Uh, but if you do a search for Fat Boy Slim, you might come across this. And this is one of the geocachers that this does a really nice, gives a nice story about this cache in Big Bend National Park that was really uh, an impressive cache because it is out in the middle of the desert and you hike about a half mile, three quarters of a mile through the desert up into this nook. And the climate completely changes from dry, desertous to cool, wet, uh, um, waterfall with butterflies. <laughs> it's just like, wow, where did this come from? And he's the one that directed me to that cache, and he's got a really nice story about that. Um, and then that's the bike, because you know we all like bikes. You know, biking is cool. That's the bike that did the the dirty work of getting me around the country. Um, and then last but not least is the C5 GPS media player, which um, is an interface, online interface for being able to. Uh, Oh, I'm not online. <laughs> For being able to see the projects, uh, analogous landscape, other path, and perfect view, and uh, see documentation and uh, written notes about locations, be able to load track logs from different expeditions and see geotagged imagery that relates to these expeditions. Um, and this was done in 2004 before geotagging was a common as a common it is today. So uh, we wrote some software to you know, uh, kind of make the, uh, the, the date, time code, timestamp in a photograph correlate to the track log information. So we hooked these images up with uh, you know, their track logs. So anyway, you can play this interface. There's, I hope you go and explore it. Uh, it's at c5corp.com. Uh, you'll be able to find this interface under uh, the landscape initiative. So um, anyway, that's the landscape initiative. Um, and that's a little bit about C5. And I'm happy to answer questions about any of that stuff. Yes? I want to hear the funny story about taking the uh, California version of well, the funny story about finding the California version of the Great Wall is that here we are with our GPS devices. Everybody had a GPS device, right? And pretty good GPS device, pretty accurate. And, you know, GPS device telling you go this way, go that way. We all think we know so much where it is. And we thought, you know, we're going to find this about an hour, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half max, right? 
And we, it happens to be right next to the Pacific Coast Trail. So we're up there hiking on the Pacific Coast Trail, you know, just having a great time. And two hours go by, and then three hours go by, literally four hours go by. And we're like, we just finally stop and pull out our maps, and look at the map, the paper map, and we find out, oh, we've been hiking around the point that we're trying to get to. The point that our <laughs> GPS device kept on telling us, go here, go here, was in the middle of the trail, which was doing this big arc. And around, around a hill. So the, we're trying to get to the wall of California. And it was up this very steep hill in the middle of the trail that was kind of circumventing this hill. <laughs> so we'd been hiking around and around and around. And we needed to go up, up, up. So, you know, it's just a, one of those ironies that here you've got all this technology. You've looked at it on map already. And then you get there. And it took four hours. We were lucky to get back before it went dark. You know? <laughs> so that's that story. Yeah. What's, uh, what is it sublime? Is it beautiful sublime? Is Bhutan sublime? Right. You know, why did you choose that word and what did you learn about the word yeah. upon research? Yeah, well, that's a great question. One of the reasons I chose the word sublime is I was interested in drawing parallels between our time and the Enlightenment, right? And if you go back in the 18th century, uh, a lot of writing and a lot of art was being done about the sublime. And if you look at Kant and a guy named Edmund Burke, their take on the sublime was that was maybe beautiful, but it was more than beautiful. It was terrifying. It was something that was threatening. You were feeling the force of nature, which made you so aware of your own mortality and forced you to kind of um, transcend your rational capabilities and move to another plane, right? So it was that kind of a thing. Um, so that, and the reason I chose sublime was to tap into that, but also it's a term that kind of gets thrown around loosely and often associated with landscape and loosely. And today we do kind of think of it as something very unusually beautiful, but it does have this more threatening quality to it. And that more threatening quality came into play in several of the locations that I would visit, which were banal in a lot of respects, but they had this challenging element to them that was uh, reminiscent of what Kant or Burke might have been writing about. But ultimately, what sublime is, as we pretty much can guess, is very subjective, right? So I'm in the Ozark Mountains, and somebody tells me to go to Hawksbill Crag because it's sublime, and I go way out of my way. The ride to get there was sublime. <laughs> but you know, going through the woods and getting there, and then here's a rock that's looking over trees you know, in a valley. It was like, OK. But if you'd just been to Zion National Park two weeks beforehand, where you're like on top of this rock and the, you know, the canyons are just like blow you away kind of quality, it was like you wanted to tell the person, go to Zion National Park. You know, because like, so, but everybody's got their, their sense of what sublime is, you know. Um, so somebody else sent me into a, a public park in the middle of Nebraska, a little stand of trees in between baseball fields and basketball courts, and here's this little stand of trees with some small rocks in there, you know, and that, so it was a very intimate, whole different thing, you know. So, yeah, sublime is hard to put your finger on, and everybody, depending on what your context is, and what your background, you know, what you're bringing to it, is very subjective. So it really wasn't to try to be, do a scientific analysis of sublimity, but to use that as a, as a, as a guide for me to go around the country and apply these technologies to looking at topography and landscape. And so I'm also doing what we now call social networking, you know, and sourcing information from a crowd and finding locations to go and visit, you know. So um, it was just a way to interact with people and get this, this series of waypoints that I wouldn't have been able to get any other way. If that makes sense. Yeah. The survey, <laughs> but sitting on the Palm Pilots in a box somewhere. We didn't really like process it, but it would be exhibited as you, that photograph has those Palm Pilots there, and each one would have show different answers. Like the one that you see most closely in that picture is a tree. So that was one of the aspects of the survey, was like draw a picture of what you see in front of you, so somebody drew a tree. But those would be displayed and have various questions from the survey, so you could kind of get a sense of what the emotional response was to that hike. Yeah, I'm sure that that was a very interesting thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, I think it would be interesting. I don't know about useful, but it would be interesting. Yeah. An, an emotional mountain? <laughs> that would be cool. That's a good name for it, too, the emotional mountain. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know, one of the things about C5 was uh, that we were uh, always kind of looking towards the next thing. So this project, uh, we really could have spent many years on it, uh, just on one of them, doing analogous landscape and hiking the mountains around the Pacific Rim. That could have been a really a long undertaking. But uh, because of, I don't know, the personalities involved in the collaboration, we're just antsy and moving on. So once we kind of got the concept across in these pieces, we were already on to doing our next project was called Quest for Success, which was another GPS kind of game uh, interactivity kind of thing that took place in San Jose. Um, so and before you knew it, we dissolved in 2007. So that these projects kind of they're at that standstill. And then individually, we've kind of gone on and worked in various modes. Some of us doing uh, locative media work. I just am wondering how that sublime location project that you undertook was it ever part of the C5 group? Yeah. So, so you came up with the idea together, but you were the one to execute it? Or? Yeah, I, mo I executed most of it. And that happened to be true for uh, a lot of the projects, but we were all involved in various aspects of the project. So we all went on the hikes, uh, and somebody else was modeling, doing, creating the CGI imagery for the, the triptychs that you saw. I mean, I, I did the, I spent the two months traveling around the country photographing places and actually built the triptychs. But I mean, the idea for it and some of the work that went into it was, it was a collaborative thing that um, you know made it happen. The discussions that we had, and there's actually some really kind of funny stories how we got to doing expeditions and all that. Uh, you know, we got there because of alcohol, basically. There's <laughs> some fun there, but anyway, I feel like I'm eating up, eating into time here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how they're, uh, what are they doing with geocaching? Well, basically, what you were talking about, you built a location to check in, and you can drop an item there, and it would be like a pizza or yeah. cake. Yeah. No one has to come to the location to pick it up. Right. And then there's like this whole gaming culture around it, you know, you've got points on it. But that sounds like that's much more uh, geared towards uh, urban, suburban kind of uh, area, yeah? At yeah. least with what you're describing in yeah. terms of the cache being. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that the people who, who are into geocaching are at least as much into hiking and being out in nature. Although, like, like I said, there are caches in Manhattan in urban areas too. Um, so well, one of the funny things about geocaching is that you're using this technology to get very close to the cache and once you're very close to the cache, it gets increasingly hard to find it because the, G the GPS only has about 15 feet of accuracy, and it depends on you moving. And once you get within 15 feet, your tendency is to stop and say, There's no one who says hotter, hotter, colder, colder. Nobody does that. <laughs> so you're looking around, and chances are the thing's right there. Scott's got it, you know. And but you spend 45 minutes looking for Scott because <laughs> you can't find it. But that's one of those ironic things about. Uh, do we have time for one more question? What's next? Uh, well, I've been working on photographic projects, uh, a project called White Collar that actually has focuses on uh, middle-aged white men, uh, businessmen, who are faced with the transitions happening in global economics. And, uh, and I'm trying to, I am capturing kind of the psychological state, possibly, that they're experiencing. And so I have a body of work that's about that specifically. I've done a lot of work about economics over the years. And that work is transitioning into uh, mapping people's commutes and thinking about how uh, lifestyles are related to workspace and what that transition is between life, you know, home life and work. So there's a project that has to do with uh, mapping commutes and, and kind of in a psychogeographic way. You know, what's your experience of your commutes, and what do you think you're passing through 
when you pass through Jersey City? What do you think it is? And then, and then drawing up data that uh, talks about what it is. You know, what is the demographic and the, what is the economic situation of that town, and, as opposed to what your perception of it is, right? So that's what I'm working on. Great, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, that's the end of our program this evening. I'd like to also encourage you to come to our, our future lectures. So on Friday, October 1st, we have Rachel Armstrong and Mitchell Joachim speaking about their art. And closing up on Thursday, October 21st, we have Marina Zirkow and our own Andrew Senor and Sandra Cordero uh, speaking about their pieces. So thanks again for coming, and uh, I hope to see you all on Friday the 1st. Good night.